from Jacob Rees-Mogg, a leading Leave campaigner, of course, uh, on the Conservative backbenches, and chairs the European Research Group. A very good evening to you, Mr Rees-Mogg. Well, uh, no much. need to ask you uh, how you voted uh, this evening. Uh, you got what you wanted tonight, but uh, are you afraid that it might lead to a softer Brexit or indeed no Brexit at all? Well, can I begin by saying how very... Honoured I am to be on a panel with Vernon Bogdan, who is the most distinguished constitutionalist in the country, so and therefore, well, we might, I know, I'm sorry about that. We may, we may bring him in so when we when we hear what you propose so, happens so, next. So, so, if you want to find out what the constitutional position no, is, we have you've been. got you've got absolutely the right man here. Um, so, what have we got? We've got a rejection of the withdrawal agreement. Uh, we've got the Prime Minister having made a statement as to how she sees the way forward. We've got a vote of no confidence tomorrow. Um, the Fixed Term Parliament Act has been very important in this because if the government had, had suffered this level of defeat previously, it would have led to a general election. I think almost impossible for it not to have done. She could resign, of course. Um, but because of the Fixed Term Parliament Act, it's changed the terms of trade, in my view. And I say this very differently okay. with, 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 with Vernon here. But that because the terms of trade have changed, her position is secure unless the very precisely worded motion tomorrow goes through, which seems very unlikely. I haven't heard of any Conservative MP who is proposing... You're certainly... You're certainly I will be supporting the Prime Minister tomorrow. I mean, you uh, did try and get her out, didn't you, in December? I failed. Yeah. I, and, you know, if you fail to do something, you've got to recognise you lost and you've got to accept somebody else has won. And I do wish the Remainers might accept this basic democratic principle in relation to the referendum. But what about this? I mean, she got, as I interjected there, you didn't answer. I mean, she could, she could walk. I don't think that would be in her character. 230, 118 Conservative MPs voting against her. But what's the one thing we know about the Prime Minister? It is that she's very dutiful. And if you listen to the statement, I'm sure you did, she made after mm. the vote, she emphasised that she'd come in to deliver Brexit and that that was what she was going to do. She's going to do her duty as she perceives it. And I, I think duty is a very old-fashioned virtue, but an extremely valuable one. It's the... The bit I most admire about Theresa May is her determination to do her duty as she perceives it, and I think that does not include uh, running away. What about the, the, the first thought I put to you, that uh, your prize, you know, as much distance as possible from the European Union, if I could put it that way, seems to be perhaps disappearing in that if Theresa May, again, she alluded to it, starts consulting across the parties, across the benches with parliamentarians. You know there is no majority in the House of Commons for any form of hard Brexit. Well, you say that, and that is the common wisdom. But MPs voted for Article 50, which says after two years, you leave. And they voted for the Withdrawal Act, which said we would leave on the 29th of March. And now a large number of them are saying, well, we never really meant that. Either they didn't read what they were voting for, or they've got very short memories. Parliament voted to leave on the 29th of March with or without a deal. That is so the what, you law. could shame them into that? I mean, you've it's, heard what an no, awful lot of it's people, not you know, the SNP and the Labour backbenches have been saying. It's not a question of shaming. It's a question of the legal position. And, and this is very important. And, and again, I defer to Vernon. But if you have parliamentary rule purely by motion, that is in fact tyranny. Parliament could decide any day that the law would be overturned by a single motion, by one vote, and that's it. We don't have that system. We have a system where laws are made deliberatively and carefully through a structured process. And therefore, a motion in Parliament can never overturn the law, and MPs well, voted for the law that we leave on well, the 29th well, you, March. You, you mentioned Professor Bogdan Orr, and uh, uh, let's have him on that. I mean, that, <laughs> that, that, that is precisely the point, though, isn't it? And you, as you made earlier in the evening, that the law has been passed to leave the European Union. And until that law, uh, and if that law is changed, is the only way that uh, exits or even an extension of Article 50 can happen. Absolutely. Jacob paid me a very generous <laughs> compliment earlier, but he's no mean constitutional thinker himself, and he's absolutely right on this point, that a statute has been passed saying that we leave the European Union on the 29th of March this year. The only way you can alter that situation is by another statute. Suppose, for argument's sake, that the House of Commons passed a motion in favour of a second referendum. That would have no legal effect. You'd have to have a bill providing for a second referendum. That would have to go through committee. It'd be quite a long process, because I imagine that Jacob and others would fight it tooth and nail. It would take some time. That would have to get onto the statute book. Or if you had some other uh, arrangement, that too would require legislation. So there are about 40-odd sitting days left till March 29th. Mm. If no other statute is passed, we leave without a deal. And I take the view, as I think Jacob probably does, that 
the vote tonight makes a no-deal departure more likely than a second referendum. Anticipating my very question, putting it uh, much more <laughs> eloquently, uh, is that the way we're headed? Is that the way you want to head, Jacob rees -Mogg? Well, I would have preferred a deal, but I think at this late stage a deal is very unlikely. I think it's hard to see what Parliament wants in place of the legislation that is there. It's the, the Matt cartoon this morning, the Telegraph, actually summed it up beautifully as to what people don't want. And if nothing else is passed into the law, that is what happens. I think a deal would have, on balance, been better, but leaving to WTO terms is nothing to be frightened of. It's how we trade with the United States, it's how we trade with other countries. There are side agreements around it that are um, technical agreements that are relatively easy to put in place. And we can trade with the EU on that basis. And crucially, uh, the president of the Port of Calais has said that yeah, nothing yeah, yeah. will change there. And that's really crucial because all the fears about no deal really relate to okay. um, blockage. But even to, to, to so-called manage it, if there is such a thing as managing no deal, would you countenance in any way, shape or form any extension of the Article 50 process, whether it comes from the UK side or jointly with the EU? No, I think we've set the clock running. It was two years. The two years will be up. And when you speak to people who voted to leave, they consistently say they voted to leave, they didn't vote for a deal. And that, I think, is what has to be delivered to ensure that the 17.4 million votes are respected. Mr. Rees Mark, always a pleasure it's to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed, Jacob Rees Mark. There. Well, let's uh, talk now with uh, someone who I think uh, takes uh, precisely the opposite view of almost everything. Mr. Rees Mark uh, said there, uh, our deputy political editor, Beth Rees, with uh, Dominic Grieve, I believe.